Welcome to the Inspired Evolution, and it is, believe it or not, I know you believe it, it's a treat to be here today. We've got with us Colleen Gallagher. Colleen, Sister Bear, welcome back. How are you? I'm so well. I'm so excited to be here and honored and it's always just so amazing to be in your space. Like, I feel like I get jolted with the energy <laughs> to open up. I'm like, yes. <laughs> oh man. It is like, uh, even as I was like logging in and like, this is going to happen today. I was just smiling ear to ear. So I've been, I've been keen to, to see you too. It's such a pleasure for those tuning into Colleen for the first time. She has been on the inspired evolution before and an amazing episode. Do go check it out. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Um, or you're here now. So stay tuned. So Colleen is, a heart-centered business, intuitive consultant. So her whole thing is helping people the way I see it, and maybe I'm putting words in her mouth and I should probably shut up because she's here, um, is helping people live the life they love. But, you know, there's a whole aspect of that that is actually like the financial abundance piece behind it too, so that we not just talk about it, think about it, dream about it, but actually actualized it. Um, Her own life story is... (laughs) remarkable. She recently read a book called An Uncompromised Life. Um, and I think that's a very apt title. Very, uh, let's put it focused is <laughs> this sister here, very determined and uh, yeah, really passionate. And she's driven um, as a global citizen, as a global citizen, a passionate, ad, uh, passionate advocate, an academic, and her whole ethos is really around helping others so much so that she's actually pursuing her PhD in psychology. Um, there is so much I could say about you, Sister Bear, but I should probably let you do your talking for you. Welcome back to the show. I'm just so grateful to be here, and you did a phenomenal job. I always love hearing what people introduce me as more than what I introduce myself as. I think it's a better reflection <laughs> for everything that. Yeah, people often say, hey, on the show, like maybe you should do the intros outside of the show. And some part of me is like, yeah, like I see a lot of podcasters doing that. But honestly, I kind of like the the doing the, the intro in it because you kind of hear my reflection of you and then you get to receive it. And it's like, yo, this is really what Amrit feels and Amrit sees and hears. On that note, dude, you recently wrote, a new book you've written this is your third book you're just a yeah. bit of a machine like so much has happened and it's only been like 18 months since I last saw you <laughs> what prompted you to write an uncompromised life yeah so uh, well first um my first book um live your truth I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer at age 14 and I was told that I'd be on medication for the rest of my life and that when I wanted to get pregnant it would be really challenging for me And so I actually left my corporate job in 2017, moved across the world to New Zealand and I self-healed myself to get off the medication. I was supposed to be on a pill a day for the rest of my life. Like at 14, like, I literally feel like that is a lifelong death sentence. Like I'm not (sighs) kidding you knowing what I know now, like that, that is just so wild to to even think that that's the legal to tell a child that. Mm. So, um, then I ended up finding myself in New Zealand and I left my corporate job and I started in the online digital marketing space and yeah. things just really took off. Like I mm. just loved it. I mean, I had some really powerful mentors that I got around some really powerful people. I started making all these online courses, like, and I went back and got my master's in global technology and development. And then, um, I traveled the world and I came back to Arizona for my master's moved to LA for my PhD and unbeknownst to me, I kind of co-created or I did a narcissistic and codependent relationship where I was brought into this kind of spiritual world. I was always that way, but in a lot of ways, I hadn't been brought to the awareness that I would betray myself to please others. And a lot of that is through, you know, family upbringing or, or different things. And so, um, the relationship took a turn when I was on the beach with my mom And she said, do you know the only reason that I had a daughter? I said, no, and I'm an only child. And I said, why? And she said, so I wouldn't be left alone with your dad and his family. Basically codependent activation right there. 12 hours later, I woke up and I knew I was pregnant. Wow. And um, I went back to LA. Um, The father of the child, um, I called him and to like tell him but he like hung up because I guess he was sick or he didn't feel well 
And then he, I was going out and I said, yeah, today was really intense. And for anyone who knows me, I know Amrit knows me, but if I was to ever message Amrit and doesn't even know me that well and said, it's a really intense, like you would probably call me being like, are you okay? What's yeah. going on? Like that is not language I use. Like that yeah. is not part of my regular vocabulary, let alone someone I was talking to daily for, you know, six to seven months. Hmm. So, um, I go to the clinic and they say, we can't tell if you're pregnant or not. You have to come back in seven days. I was like, no, no, I know. And they were like, no, we can't, we can't do anything yet. So I went back three days later and they, um, did confirm I was pregnant and I decided that I was going to let my child go. Mm. And, um, right before I went in, there was a little girl looking at me and it was, that's when I figured out it was six days since I intuitively knew I like the, with my mom, like I knew that I had right. the fetus in me. And there's a little girl in front of me. And I felt that the fetus inside of me was a little girl. And I felt like I was looking at this little girl who was looking at me, which would have been the future if I would have had this child. Mm, totally. And so I went in and I took the first pill and um, I left and that same little girl now was screaming. So I felt like the trauma of what I was doing. And so um, the story kept going basically. And I came back home and I get my mail a couple of days later after a second, the second pill, which is the most painful one. And I saw like this fetus leave and put, go in like a little alien ship box, basically mm -hmm. like galactic little safety cellular thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, I go downstairs to get the mail and there's a little girl there. And I said, Oh, what's your name? And she's like, my name is Ella. I was like, oh, okay. And then her mom was like, your name's not Ella. It's Leela. I was like, what? And so I was like, oh my God, like this is the second confirmation. So I get my mail mm. and I open it and there's a pink card that's addressed to me and it has like who it's from ripped off of it. Yeah. And the post office has it stamped of, it was mailed October, 2019. And it was shipped to my uncles and then mailed to me because when I first moved to LA, I stayed with him for like a month or two while I found it, found my place I wanted to live. And so he it arrived ironically three days after this. And mm. I open it and it says, holy guacamole, you're going to have a baby. No one knew like, this is not possible. And, um, the child's Whoa. dad's favorite thing for breakfast is avocado toast. So the fact that it said like had an avocado on it and like, that, like through his mom and lineage. And so I opened the card and there's $245 with the gift cards mm. and the receipt was stamped September 21st that these gift cards are bought. It was stamped that it shipped October, 2019. This fetus wasn't actually conceived. Like the day it would have been conceived was November 13th. I didn't find out till the day after Thanksgiving. Mm. So there's no way like this card, was, like the timestamp yeah, could have connected. like happened. And so, um, then the woman who sent it, I didn't know who it was. I had never met her, but him and her were friends on Facebook and her title is mother. And so it was just like this crazy experience. But when I left the clinic totally to go eerie. through all of that, when yeah. I, when I left the clinic, um, I got the voice of God with like the first pill and said, pull your car over. And I heard my daughter in my head and she said, never compromise yourself again for love. And you will adopt me in this life. And so I started writing profusely, like whatever was coming through me. And I started writing my story and 12 principles came through and that's the book. That's how we're here. Wow. 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 Tell me that again. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, so, was, so we have, we have three big variables here. We've got three, big, this is the research journey. We've got overcoming Western medicine diagnosis. We've got a yeah. codependent narcissistic relationship. We have miracles. Then we have also family and generational lineage. Wow. Dude, there is so much in there to unpack. But the key thing for me in there is your willingness and trust to surrender to the process and listen to when things were coming through is actually what birthed this book. So you feel like she was communicating through you as you took the time to write out what seems to be to write out your truth um, about an uncompromised life from her, yeah. which it, it's almost poetic to sort of feel into where we've come from, from live your truth. And I love because you must have read my mind. We have a poetry book that's in the works. So. <laughs> Great job, Amrit. It's what I do. Intuition, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but yeah, like it's it's quite remarkable. And so what did, um, we're talking about the 12 principles, how much of this was informed by your own journey versus how much of it was informed by the journey that you felt was being informed by her presence? 
Well, she's always with me, you know, so it's, this book really is a co-creation of me and her. And I write that in the very beginning. I say, I acknowledge this book to Ella and myself and the universe, Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, this, it was a really challenging situation. And I know that I am going to be adopting the soul of her in my life because when I was 14, I always knew I, it was going to be hard to get, have children. So I just always thought, Oh, I'll adopt, I'll adopt. And so I really feel like I've been manifesting the story since I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. I really feel like this manifestation took, what was it? 24, 12 years. Wow. Wow. Oh my God. I did not. Mm. Okay. So this story from 14 to 26 took 12 right after I turned 26. So what was it? Seven days. It was number 13, which is the number of the goddess that it, that it manifested 12 years, which is almost the exact date to the surgery. I think I should look at that after this podcast wow. theory. Mm. And so I always knew I wanted to adopt. And I feel like all these things happen because I, I'm like adopting the child. And so, um, how that's going to work. I know some of you maybe who are not into manifestation or it's new, you can sit here and think like, she's lost it a little bit. Like what's going on <laughs> and she's out of this world. But what I'd like to say is that, you know, every moment in the now is making your future. So like every single word, like you, by you being here, there's either a loss you've gone through, or there is something you want to create, or there's a trauma you're holding on to that you're desiring to release, or you wouldn't have co-created being here in this moment. Mm. And so when I'm saying this story too, it's like, when you have a knowing and you want a desire, just keep speaking into the now, because it will always happen. Mm. And so that's a linear, I mean, quantum physics, this is actually just science. Like we don't even, there's not even something that we have to like a specific vibrational match of whatever you talk about is going to happen. Um, and so I, I can't really say like with that, I mean, 12 years, God, maybe it was a a year principle a year, you know, but I think some of them, you know, they came to me. I mean, some of them are my truth, but I mean, the whole book, the subtitle is overcome heartbreak and trauma, experience the unexplainable and truly fall in love. And I feel like my daughter really represents me truly falling in love because my whole brand is on creating a lifestyle you love. And I Mm. think I knew that with business, but I don't know if you ever quite have it when you like have the love for your child. Like, I think that Mm. was a massive thing as a woman to like be initiated into womanhood. Like it was an initiation. It was a deeper understanding of consciousness. It's allowed me at 27 now to have a greater availability to connect with more women. Like Mm. that's just it. And so the, the principles there's a lot of them. I mean, the disease of people pleasing, like learning to say no, um, like a heart centered business, surrendering to the adventure, understanding the laws of the universe. Like there's, there's a lot of them, but they're, like, yeah. they, they're, they're all different, but they all have different stories that they represent generational lineage. So understanding like how, why my mom said that to me was so monumental and me like stopping mm-hmm. the generational lineage of people pleasing and cutting the cord of codependency. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to dive in there, but it, I think part of it is I think no matter what you do in life, and this is where I even left my corporate job. And you can even say this with the your podcast, which is, you know, like one of the fast, the, the fastest growing in Australia, you know, like there's a thread might be different for a man, but we can get into that. Like there's a thread that's pulling you forward. Like there's a thread that like, it's almost like when you get up and brush your teeth, it becomes habitual that there's just a thread guiding you somewhere. Like, wow, we need to rest wow, we need to do that. Or, hmm, let me observe that. Like, there's just these different things guiding you. And when you can practice your life in such a way where you can hear this and let your vehicle, your body move you in that way, Mm. it just becomes better than you think. And I feel for men, I mean, biology, it's probably a little bit more of a penetrative field than a guidance because Mm. women were kind of pulled where biology, men penetrate, we receive. But Mm. it's still that thing of, I don't really know why this is going that way, but it's going that way. So I better go that way. Like, you know, and it's, Surrender. it's in the same thing, just a little bit biology different. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's uh, what I'm hearing through coming through there is like following your intuition, but it's, it's, it's more than just your intuition. It's like a, it's like a GPS kind of you're the dot and you're just sort of moving through and, and finding your way. And yeah, it's a, uh, bit of a trip (laughs) and as your story clearly um, articulates as well it's a bit of a trip when you're living from that place of surrender and man there is so much to go into but one of the things that is most present for me um, we will totally talk about spiritual entrepreneurship because I know (laughs) I know you're um, basically almost the whole chapter got featured on um, Yahoo Finance so Mm -hmm. like 
fucking nailed it. But and I love spiritual entrepreneurship is like the whole ethos around the spider evolution. But we will get to that, dude. People pleasing. It has been such a massive body of work, even just for me personally recently. Mm. Um, this year uh, I took stock, like every year I kind of take stock of where things are at in my business and my personal life and how things are going. I don't really set goals for the next year, but I sort of cut, use that as a tool to sort of align my intention for the, for the coming year. And this year's intention has been simplicity for me. I'm trying to simplify. And on that journey, Actually, I read this remarkable book called Essentialism. Highly recommend it for those tuning in. But um, the simplicity was evoked by this taking look back on what I'd achieved over the year. And I'd achieved so much in like six to eight different directions. I'd moved a meter in each direction. I was just like, wow, what a year. Like so much had happened across all the different coaching businesses, speaking, like all these different things. But then I also took stock and realized, actually, there's only one Amrit moving in eight directions right now. And if I really want to sort of, you know, have the impact that I'm seeking to have, I think I need to, and pardon the pun, especially in this space, it's completely inappropriate, but it's the way I've been terming it is kill off some of my babies to sort of literally like, you know, let go of some of these things, which are like the things that I created to only focus on one or two Mm. to really bring myself to them. And that has been so hard like so hard that I can't even begin to acknowledge because it's me learning to say no even to myself and the things that I love doing right to focus on the things that I love doing the most it's like wow you're really having to pick a priority here and what that obviously as we know and in this space this is a totally open conversation that we can have so love the space you hold there is you know that me learning to be able to do that with myself is also reflected in like my relationship with the other um, so when I'm with people, it's like, I'm always the first to sort of be like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Don't worry. Like I'm always a yeser. Yeah. Always the yes person, like the yeser. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Like, let's do this. Do you want to come here and give this talk? Yeah, sure. We'll figure it out. Let's do it. And learning actually to set like really tight boundaries by just using the word no has been a whole body of work. Um, and it hasn't been easy. It's definitely not like yeah, like if you are a people pleaser, it can be such a skin to shed. How are you going there? Yeah, so I had two chapters actually that you touched on. One is called the disease of people pleasing and the other is owning your nose so you can live a heck yes life. So I literally, there's two parts of that. Um, I mean, I betrayed myself to such a point of this incident really occurring. And it was the most challenging thing because deep down I really do love this man. You know, there's many incredible things about him, but the reality is, is he's built a life infrastructure behind a very successful business, but he's not happy. And I, he was kind of using me to like scapegoat, I think out of it. Like he wanted to get Mm. into the digital space through this thing or try other creative ways that, you know, Colleen would make up Mm. (laughs) all all my ideas. And, you know, I, I, I feel like when you're an enlightened person or on that path, people want to naturally come and grab onto you because you are a channel of openness. Like there is just this ever pouring source open connection that I think we often forget because of how connected, how disconnected other people are. So, you know, when I was with him out of the life infrastructure, the love was just so real, but at the same time he was dating other women and he kind of would say it, but then lie about it. And then like, it was always, and then like the screaming would be just crazy. Then I would be emotionally chaotic. Like I wouldn't be understanding why my feelings were happening. Or I would like be thinking thoughts, like the overthinking of like, I thought you were mad at me when it's like, we just hung out and there was, it was fine. And then as an intuitive, your mind's racing. So it's, and you're trying to like say, like take ownership of my feelings. I'd be like, I just feel this way. And then it, it would just be like, you're so dramatic. Like it was just like, and then you like, can't even think almost like you're, you're mm-hmm. trying to make sense of something that is just spinning. Mm-hmm. Like, and you know, being a woman and feeling very responsible for my womb and my nervous system, there's no way I could offer a co-creation of a child into that. And Mm. 
that to me was the hardest decision. It was a very conscious decision I made. I can't imagine anyone doing that decision, not conscious. Like I feel so grateful for the work God gave me. Cause I feel like I was trained and prepared for that moment, but it changes you fundamentally on a cellular structure that you just will never again do it. Like it's, it's like I said, my daughter always being there. Like even the fact of like people will message me on Facebook and I just will just delete it. If I don't feel like opening, like it's gotten to that place where like before I'd be like, Oh, let me help. Or let me see the different perspective. Like it's, it's totally changed because I also know that adopting my daughter, this is not something I can tolerate in my reality. So it, in a lot of ways, it inspired me to start evolution and inspired me to evolve mm. so that I can be prepared to adopt my daughter, like whatever manifestation that's going to do, but like, I'll do whatever it takes, you know, like that's, and I am doing whatever it takes. Like I'm listening to the things, but I, I think that was the key. And I, I guess I'm here because I hope that through my story, you're listening to this. You don't have to get to that decision for that to be you. Like, mm. I really hope for every woman or man, like, and I write this, I have a, I have a poem codependency actually in the, in the book. And I hope that you don't let the words like I love you fool you. And I, I think sometimes we can feel a moment of love with someone. We can, we can, I like write it, you know, we can be laying on this galactic bed or we can just look at someone that, like the way they look at pasta and it's like that's the moment of love but that's not sustainable and I think we all need to hold a standard for ourselves like sustainable love sustainability like is this something that can be repeated not just sprinkles of it here and there and I, I think for me that was really what did it um mm. and I think now a lot of people can say you know, I'm a little bit more selfish. Like I do get that. Or I, you know, our Colleen doesn't respond or yeah. I mean, I'm not definitely not as giving as I used to be, but I'm choosing my daughter over you. And that's just is what it is. Like, and that, that can sound as harsh, but like, I know what I want and I will, I'm, I will stop at nothing until I adopt my daughter. And it's like, I hear the voice and I know what it takes. And I think you've got to find that. And I, I did find that in a way with my first book and living your truth and growing the businesses and I've always done that, but it's, it's different with a child for sure. I can feel, yeah, the, the clarity of purpose is kind of what I'm hearing coming through as you're describing um, where you're at right now, which is quite remarkable because for those that know you, myself included, um, you've been quite clear from the outset to actually hear you articulate it this way. Um, it is quite profound. Yeah. Yeah. And so what does that mean? Because then you wrote the third chapter, which is on spiritual entrepreneurship of the way that I term it. Um, but yeah, you wrote it on conscious business. Um, what does like, what more could potentially be birthed at your end? You're already walking the walk, talking the talk, living the life. What is, what's being unpicked in there? Or is it yeah, a content so reminder for where we're, where we're headed? Yeah. So my PhD, um, there's something called connectivism learning theory. So when you and I were in school, Amrit, it would have mm. been cognitism, um, learning theory that that's how mm. like institutions in our government set it up. Mm. Assuming everyone listening to this is from a developed nation. If you're not, then it would probably be more like behavioralism still. So there's these different ones. Well, connectivism is the first learning theory that's going to combine digital learning with, you know, I guess old school learning, I don't know, I don't like traditional world. learning. Yeah. Um, technically, we're all already really doing connectivism learning theory, um, but I really want to work on the corporate sector, the tech sector, and just in the online space of of how do we really design sustainable education systems that are more tailored for us to choose self curriculums. Mm. Um, and a lot of this has to do with AI. So, like, if, for example, like when I say this, like you guys choosing to be here you are already choosing an AI like um, profile for yourself. Like you don't mm. even know it, but you really are. And so that's why it's like people like Amra, I honor you so much because by him showing up, like he really is letting you evolve into a space, into your future that you may not have had before, which is why technology is just such a crucial piece in our education and in our involvement, or you can call it 
personal development. I mean, there's so many ways, but mm -hmm. um, I really want to go into that space of, of that designing the infrastructure from more of a business to business place where a lot of my business so far has been biz business to consumer, meaning that I have online courses that you guys can buy or I have books or I have an Oracle deck um, mm. or I do like, you know, private mentorship or retreats like that's mm. it's a lot more just to consumers, what we call it. Mm. I, I want to get into that that space of business again um, and really designing that because so much of our lives is influenced by that space without us realizing. And so that's really what's next for me and kind of building that consulting and um, building teams and, and management, but, and my poetry book and my fourth book and <laughs> the magazine, because there's all these, all these things. So it's not like it's, it's, yeah. fun. it's always multidimensional. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And that is fascinating. That is fascinating. The whole idea around, um, our education evolving out of, yeah, basically our direct relationship with, and like you said, most kids these days going to school have iPads. So they're already in that model of connectivity um, as you, as you described it, but I yeah. think, and okay. like for those that are tuning into like what we're potentially talking about, what I'm visualizing is like, it's basically YouTube. It's like, every time I go in, it's providing me updates on like, Hey, do you want to watch this? Do you want to watch this? And it's learning me every time I'm learning, like I'm watching something. And honestly, I feel like YouTube where most of you are watching this podcast, um, is probably my, the new classroom for me anyway like I love it it's like you watch something there's a comment section everybody's raising their hands liking each other giving each other's high fives I love YouTube as a platform um, but it's also every time I consume something which is what you're pointing out it's it's learning what my preferences are and what more of my like hobbies are and so like you open up my YouTube and it's all like music videos and philosophy and personal development it's like just this stuff but I look across at my like wife's YouTube channel when she opens up and I'm like oh like even there's like, and we're quite similar, <laughs> right? But there's so much difference. Is that fundamentally the the differences that we're kind of alluding to in and around there, like in terms of how we learn? Yeah. So a lot of it, right. When we grew up, like it was told, like, this is the curriculum you're going to study. You need to get this to get into a certain college to this, like our generation, you and I, we definitely, whether you went to college or not, we mm. have taken it into our own hands to do self-learning and self-curriculum. Yeah. So connectivism learning theory is basically understanding networks, right? So everything is a network. So you have an inspired evolution network. I have the Colin Gallagher network. I have the Colin Gallagher podcast that you're going to be on, you know, like I have <laughs> my different books, each have different networks and they each have different things. So every moment you can choose to plug in or plug out of a network basically mm -hmm. in this virtual world, which can also bring you to the physical world. So you're mm -hmm. really taking this esoteric spiritual world now into a very tangible thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thing is when, when we're doing this is that we've still got to figure out a little bit where I think this is where the, the theory, what I'm kind of studying or what I'm alluding to is it has some weak points, um, is there's not enough structure yet. Like, whereas yeah. the other ones did like this one, it's so up to self, which we know that, you know, humans are creatures of habit. So if you weren't put in an environment to self reflect, self develop, self be inspired, self motivated, Feedback. which majority yep. of the population was not, mm. you are, you're still not going to be able to get that. And you're going to have now a larger gap in cognitive ability, which is, which is going to be a massive issue. Like we can't mm. really have that. Some people who are hyper stimulated because of, you know, technology and some people mm. who are moving with mail, like very slow, mm. which is, you know, would not, which is not bad. It's just, you're, it's you a discrepancy don't want that between gap. the two. You don't want that gap to grow too big because the bigger that gap is, like even in let's say in each country, the bigger the gap is in um, financial distribution, so like zero dollars to a billion dollars, the mm. more likely there's for war. And this that gap happens primarily on knowledge, right? Because mm. the amount of GDP a country has is largely based on their education system and how they're educating and how they're having people work in their economies. So you don't want that gap to continue to increase as this younger generation is going to continue to do that. And the older generation, not it's going to cause a big, big issue. And so, um, yeah, this is kind of what I'm talking about my PhD in studying. So we're, I'm in year and a half and I still have like a year and a half left <laughs> for your program, but we're about a year and a half in, and I'm really, really interested in this. And I really want to see, like, I want to sit at the table to talk about this with key players, definitely because the passion of mine and um, you know, while I'm building that, you know, I have my clients that are just starting the online world or they have big dreams like this and helping mm. them gain their own capital instead of doing like a nonprofit or relying on, you know, a, like just donations. That's, mm. you know, I want to make you have a 
inspire you or create you to have your own business model in the digital space or your own brand and your own community. Cause having your own community is more valuable than anything in the world. It will continue to be. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I do now. And then through all my different programs and all my different things, and then well, I just I kind it. of keep adding different product lines. I love it because what I'm seeing is like from the highest level, like with your PhD, it's like actually trying to influence curriculum so that people have the freedom potentially to learn and live the way that, you know, it's exactly the things that they want to learn for themselves. So it's self-driven curriculum. So they can actually learn to live the life that they love. <laughs> and in the day to day, <laughs> you're also doing your thing, which is helping people live the life that they love, which is beautiful. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really, I love it. It's kind of like the two scissor approach coming all the way from the macro and all the way through to the micro. That's so awesome. Sister bear, always very inspiring to tune into what's going on in your world. Um, what was the hardest chapter to write in the book? Falling in love. It was the hardest one because, um, oh, I don't want to get emotional, but anyway, I was like, it's the hardest one because, you know, I, as a codependent, which I think as women, we, we are a lot of times, I think men are too, like you brought it up too. like men love to, to provide men love to please. Like it's, I don't want to say it's even gender specific. Like it, mm -hmm. it's, I think women please to like get men. I think men please to like try to make women happy. Like it's like acceptance and to provide happiness. Mm -hmm. Like it literally is that thing. And so, um, this man and I had many lifetimes together. This wasn't the first time like this child happened. And, you know, I, I share in the story and first the third time we hung out the trinity i gave him a, a selenite rose crystal um shortly after the child go like a week later i'm walking down i live on santa monica boulevard in la in west hollywood so not a like not this is not a little private street like i live in a very like nice building but places like downtown and mm -hmm. so i'm walking down and there's five crystals and it's a purple amethyst heart a week mm. after let it go. And I'm thinking like, and I gave him that one too. And he has no, he had no idea at the time. I don't know, maybe he figured out now, but you know what that meant, but you know, there's so many parts to this. And so it was so beautiful because in so many ways, I just fell in love. Like I fell in love with life and him. And I mean, just breaking the matrix in so many ways, we both did that. I mean, we had two people, he was in a very more linear industry. I'm in this esoteric industry. Like, you know, it was, there's so many beautiful things about it, but it was hard because it was so painful and the betrayal was so deep. Mm. Um, and you know, it, it ended abruptly. Like, you know, he, we, the last night I saw him, he, we were driving to an event and we were doing the thing. He said, I have visions of a silver pole going through your head and you dying. And he had no idea what he just said, had no, because he's not in this, but to, uh, to those of you listening who are anywhere in energetic, this is like the worst thing you could ever say. Like all you hear is you just co-created my death. Like th that's what happened. Mm. So I'm in a state of shock and I'm driving and, uh, we go to this event. I drive back and, um, he puts my car in neutral on the main road. I pull over in a gas station. And I pull out of the gas station and a car almost hits my side of the car. And then he wakes up at midnight and expects me to drive him home. And I couldn't do it. And so the next day I messaged him and just said, Hey, I hope you're well. I, decided, I thought about what you said. I decided I don't want you in my life anymore. Please don't contact me. Um, like I want no communication. And he still had no idea because I lied and I said it was a miscarriage. I never told him the truth of what it was. And like six months or eight months later, I, um, he sent me an email and I replied to the email telling him that I had an abortion mm -hmm. and I've never heard from him since. And so it was so hard because you had this, it was a betrayal. You know, I can't pretend that I was all this airy fairy. I, I, I write in the book multiple times in our unawareness, we co-created darkness. Like I also became dark in my feelings of unsafety and my feelings of not feeling supported then you know i i'm sure as a, and in a man you know i emasculated him in a lot of ways through that story i didn't let him show up i didn't let him provide financial support i didn't tell him the truth i like just ghosted you know really but you have to do that from a narcissistic standpoint in many ways you know he emotionally the energy he represents that comes through him emotionally abused me and emotionally made me codependent even more on him so it was so hard to write that chapter because there is so much love I have for him, but I had to love me more. And it was because I had to adopt my daughter. 
I, it was just, I had to do it. I couldn't betray. And I, I made that promise to my daughter with the book. So that was the hardest principle, but it's my favorite one. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, it's uh, what I'm hearing is this. Yeah. Codependence is such an interesting. Ah, oh, I don't know how to nerd out on this with you, but I'm, I'm going to try. No, just so, say it. Just, yeah, yeah so, no, no filter. Well, as you, as you mentioned, right? Like everything's a network, mm. everything's networked in and yet codependence is like, you know, interdependence is a pretty beautiful thing, right? It's like where you're both dancing or communities are dancing around each other and everybody brings a different element to, this, to society, to community, and it's all working and ticking. Um, but codependence is, yeah, it's interesting the space that it holds um, and the traumas that can be inflicted when networking is just so innate to the nature of life. Yeah. And one of the things I write in the book too, so <clears throat> I didn't know he lived with a woman, but one time he invited me over and he said, I invited a friend over. And so they lived together. I didn't know that, but she came up from the top of their house instead of like the bottom where the pool was like, mm. it was really deceptive. And that was the moment in the pool. I heard the voice of God come through me saying, they're going to try and get you pregnant because she didn't want a baby. And he did. And, um, I, I had never really been in an open dynamic. It was not really something I wanted to experience, but I felt like I fell in love. And then that was like something that was added on. Like you're, you're already at the trip and it's like, add on, like, just so mm. you know, by the way, there's a whole thing of the whole other network of networks that I didn't tell mm. you about and being an intuitive, it's, Clear communication, I should say, is always important. But when people's hearts are involved, it's extra important because when you are physically involved with someone, you can pick up on them energetically at a whole different space. I mean, you can already do it as an intuitive. I mean, Emma and I can pick up on each other. We can, you can tune into a frequency. But when you are physically connected, like you and your partner, like there's, there is a, a connection there that you can just feel. And so it was just such a confusing time for me. And I would try to describe or explain my emotions, but it just, you know, that the, the archetype of him doesn't like to be called out. You know, he lives in his own land. I lived in a land that was dependent on him. So it was, you get in this very muddy water and it's, mm. it's really hard um, because that energy that these people represent know how to hook into codependence. They know th this is not just like a one time. These, this is, I mean, lifetimes of a relationship that was breaking a curse in this lifetime. You know, it wasn't just one thing and he's totally unaware of this world. I'm totally aware of it. So you, you're, it's just, chaos you're, you're trying to I do say this you're trying to merge two operating systems that are you're trying to operate like on a um what's it called a uh, apple and a microsoft like you have just so different mm -hmm. and you're trying to connect the coding and there that's mm -hmm. a very challenging coding to connect without a very strong foundation before it already got to where it got to mm -hmm. um so it's it's just important I think I'm so grateful for it because I think it's really prepared me for where I'm going in life and, you know, who I can relate to. And, um, there's a lot of businessmen that I deal with that are very high level and I'm very young, <laughs> 27. So like it, there's a lot of things I would have been more naive to if I didn't mm -hmm. go through this experience where now it's much easier for me to see unconscious manipulation tactics, you know, whether, whatever that it is. So, um, I can't be mad about it, you know, but it, it, it's a whole network of energies you're opening into when we go into that world. Cause you're going into a very spiritual channeling entities, energies, attachments, demons, light world, world three, arguably that's going on in this. I mean, there's, there's so much to it and you have to take yourself out of it, which is what happened for me and go, what does the story represent? And the story represented truly falling in love. The story represented that there's another narrative if women are told they can't have children. There is another narrative. Like there's another narrative that if you had child loss or if you've lost anyone, like how you can connect with them. And I show that through my, you know, my crystal, like crystals, my daughter and I, Rose Quartz, heart, open, heart opener. 
Um, that's all we, that's all we have right now, but we'll like grow the line as it grows. Next one's amethyst. But, um, you know, those, those are the things that it, it gave me to give us tools and resources, because these things that I'm talking about are very challenging. They're, they're much easier to pretend they didn't happen than to be able to expand through them. And my desire is for my story to be an expansion for every person knowing that there is hope and there's another narrative. Mm. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing yourself so openly and so vulnerably. There is a question which I'm afraid to ask. I'm going to have to ask it, (laughs) which is actually inappropriate to ask. So no, do it, do it, do it, do it. I feel it, do it. I, I dig that, like, I know you and I know that there is so much acceptance in your world that it'll like, it'll almost be like, obviously nothing. Um, it's probably going to be the answer, but part of me wants to sort of s- still ask and, and see what comes untethered in it. Um, do you have any regrets in and around some of this? And I get by regrets, I don't necessarily mean like there's still energetic hooks in it, but if you went back and would you do it, would you do, I would parts do it of all it? over again in the same way? I knew there's you were going to say that. I, would <laughs> I knew about you were going to say that. <laughs> there's, there's absolutely no element of it that you would do differently. No. Mm. No. Mm. I mean, it's 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 all so perfectly crafted. I couldn't have my daughter if it was any other way. It wouldn't have mm. happened that way. And and I think maybe that's why I hold on to it. Is there a desire always that you wish? the first time you became pregnant that, you know, the first person that you were with, like they could have been a amazing dad, or you could have seen a life with them. I think every woman that's part of the fairy tale, like, you know, and I think it's changed my mind. I definitely don't date anymore unless it's like, could I see this guy being a father to Ella or other children that I have? Like, I know it's intense, but like, I never thought of it that way. Like it was never a possibility, but now it's, I've, it's made it a lot more sacred, that whole space. Like it's, that is like what it's done, you know, but I, yeah, I, I pray for him. I hope he gets well. Um, obviously my daughter's going to read the story and she can do whatever she wants. I'm not going to facilitate, you know, what a, that, but she, you know, when she's of age, she can choose her own destiny, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any regrets. Like it really was the most beautifully orchestrated artistic devotion of God through me. And I feel so grateful to be so connected. And the moments of trauma where it literally felt like you could not get out of bed. You are literally convincing yourself not to text this person. Like I've never done heroin. I've heard it's like heroin, but like, I remember you would be at the phone. Like, do I email back? Do I text? Like you're, you're so close to it. And I'm like, you're stronger than this. You're stronger than this. Like literally it's like, it's, it is a full body resistance you have to do. And so, but I still wouldn't change it. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Wow. And who tuning in is the book for other than Ella yourself in the universe? <laughs> um, who, what is it that you really want? Like for what is it that you really want? Well, that sounded a bit weird, but what are you hoping for that, you know, someone picks it up and what is um, the impact that the other person has? Cause there's 12 different principles, all of it. There's so much in there for an uncompromised life, learning to say no, not being a people pleaser, setting up your world in a certain way, falling in love. That is so much in there. So many colors to the tapestry. Um, yeah. What's the intention for the person tuning into the book? To, to truly fall in love. That's the experience, you know, overcome heartbreak and trauma experience and I know and truly fall in love. Like I will always believe even my first book and last, our first podcast, you know, mm. on my second book and my next book, like, you know, I, I do really believe love is the most powerful force on the planet. It's changed my life in so many ways, you know, and it's funny. I feel like I, sometimes I go on dates and people are like, have you been in love before? And I'm like, well, I feel like I've been in love with like eight people, but that sounds really bad. So I maybe shouldn't say that. <laughs> like, that's just really what I feel like I've traveled, you know, I've been to 42 countries at the age of 27. You know, I've, I've done so many things. I've been blessed to be around some of the most incredible humans and every human's incredible, but I mean, people that would just blow your mind. And, mm. um, I've experienced some of the greatest heart openers and I've experienced some of the greatest pain. And I just want everyone to know, like falling in love is possible. Like your, 
your modern day fairy tale, your love story. Like it is out there. It is possible. It is happening. It is real time. Like now Mm. it's a complete lifestyle. Like it's not just in a person. It's not just in one moment that you have the rest of your life. Like it's every single moment you can drop in deeper to a greater love story. And, And that's what I hope for this book. And that's what I promised my daughter is that we would make every beautiful love story possible on this planet. Thank you so much for sharing yourself so vulnerably, so openly, so abundantly as always, sister. And I know that it's not just, um, yeah, it's not just today that you've taken the time out to be with us. You know, it's a lifetime's work that informs this conversation that we're having today and potentially lifetimes is work and uh, potentially the work of Ella too. So <laughs> thank you so much for all that you brought to, um, to today's episode. Um, links to all the Colleen's amazing references and links to the new book will be in the show notes. So you can definitely grab it there, tune in, check it out. Um, yeah, as you know, Colleen is remarkable. So I'm sure you're going to love the read. And uh, on behalf of myself and the Inspired Evolution Tribe, wishing you all the best, Sister Bear. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave us a comment. And if you want to stay in tune for new episodes launching every Monday, hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Stay inspired to evolve.